Over the last hundred years, we've forgot a lot about what builds our bodies. Here's a big one. Exercises are skills. Treat them as such. What does that mean? The better you can perform an exercise, the more you'll get out of it. It's not just about working out your back, making your legs sore, getting a pump in your shoulders. It's about perfecting the skill of the exercise. Practice them as such. You'll get better results, less injuries, build more muscle, and burn more body fat with this attitude. By the way, the Bronze Era lifters understood this. That's why they were able to lift tremendous weights at low body weights. Uh, and of course, this was all before steroids or even supplements. So learn from the wisdom of the past. Treat exercises like skills. Well, speaking of Bronze Era, I, I imagine that a lot of those lifts that uh, are quote unquote unconventional now uh, were just sort of abandoned because the skill part of it was a little bit higher, let's say, than just, you know, some of our conventional compound lifts. Even now we're like more uh, prone to doing machines and things that are a bit more easily accessible. hundred percent. So here's what's interesting about what you just said. If you pick two exercises and let's say one exercise uh, has a value of 10 in terms of its ability to build muscle and strength and bolster the body. And let's say the other exercise is a five, okay, in, in that same regard. However, the 10 exercise, it's going to take you some time to learn. It's going to take you some time to perfect. Initially, you're going to get better results off the five because there's a very short learning period. So a good example would be like a leg press yeah, to a squat versus a barbell squat. Yeah, if yeah. I took two groups of beginners and I only ran a test for, let's say, four weeks or eight weeks, maybe even 12 weeks, and I compared the results of a leg press to a squat. In fact, in the beginning, the leg press might actually outperform it, and or at the very least, it'll probably be equal. But what we don't see is as the person, as the group continues to perfect the skill of the squat, the value of the squat continues to grow, and, you st and they get better results over time, continuously over time. So that's 100% Why is true. that? Why is that not factored in when when fitness professionals discuss exercise selection, why is skill acquisition not uh, factored into that conversation? We always, we, we tout these studies that are six to 12 weeks long and, oh, this one, more muscle activation or yeah. this one in, in this short period of time. But nobody talks about the, the benefits of something that is difficult to learn how to do as far as the adaptation process and the total amount of muscle and strength that you'll build over time. Why is that not factored in? I think it's, hmm. it's all forgotten wisdom is my opinion. I think we, we've, is it, told, I think we have, and I think the market, I don't uh, think it's, yeah, I think maybe I, it's me the I measure. Think the to consumer measure. has been, um, uh, I think that we've catered too much of our workouts in the way that we conduct, um, uh, training too much to, um, to what the expectations are to the actual consumer coming in and their desire to change their body's composition and, yes. uh, and to also um, uh, alleviate some of the barriers in terms of like them actually like stepping foot in the gym and like getting them consistent. And so we've sort of weighed that way heavier, which I understand because that's, that's a monstrous task to get somebody to even want to keep doing this as like a, uh, a part of a practice that they're going to do for their health. But uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's one of those things like we need to revisit that because yeah. it, it is, it, it's such a different mentality and it's something that like, if you can establish like a higher skill level and of an understanding of these types of exercises, what, you know, that's going to do for you long-term greater so that any of these other exercises that we've been using. Yeah. Well, let's break it down for a second. Uh, learning a skill of a lift. Let's say you do a, a, a one-arm bent press. It's an old school exercise. Nobody does anymore. You go to try to do it. Those of you that are watching who are experienced have probably never done one. So you're going to go to try and do it. It's going to be really hard. You're not going to be able to lift much weight. So you have to kind of learn the skill of the exercise. Now, what's happening in that process? Your central nervous system is adapting. Your muscles are adapting to this new movement. And they're adapting in ways that they're not used to. It's very novel. So you start to get tremendous benefit through the acquisition of the skill itself. Then when you started to master the skill, now you move to the next phase, which is now I could push the resistance. I can add weight to the bar. I can make myself stronger. 
and continue to perfect the skill now with heavier weight. The entire process resulting in a body that's changing. Now, the problem is that people have forgotten that exercises or skills. I'll take it way back to the most basic, running. Running. Everybody, people who start running today, nobody thinks to themselves, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lace up some running shoes and then I'm going to go like, I'm going to go practice running and really relearn how to run because the last time I really ran a lot was when I was 12. Mm -hmm. Nobody does that. Everybody goes, I'm going to put my shoes on and I'm going to just go run, even though I never run. I'm going to go run until I'm tired. Yeah. And so what you end up with is terrible technique, terrible running form, high rate of injury, and a low rate of results. It's not just the high rate of injury. So as I'm talking about, you know, mm -hmm. practicing exercise like a skill, I think it's kind of, it's more obvious that you're going to reduce your risk of injury by doing that. But what's less obvious to people is they actually get less results if they don't do it that way. Because a barbell squat uh, done properly has a tremendous amount of value. A barbell squat done improperly has very little value in terms of results. And then, of course, the injury risk. Now, it has risk. to be a, a bit of kind of like a bell curve, though, right? Because, I mean, our, our, our buddy uh, Steve Cook made a comment on the discussion that we had about, you mm -hmm. know, the mm -hmm. deadlift or the squat being like a king yeah. of all exercises. And I think he put snatch in there. Like, why is it? Yes. Was, was it a snatch? Was it a clean? It was a clean to a press. A clean, clean yeah. to press. That's yeah. right. It was a clean to press. So it, Olympic lift, right? So it was an Olympic lift in there, and and there's some truth to that, right? Like if yeah. you uh, if you can do that movement and continue to do that movement as as you it's age, it, in, incredible uh, benefits. But that the I think the skill to in order to to be able to do that movement is so high that the risk is is too high for most people. So where where would you say like those exercises? I mean, it'd be cool to create some sort of a, a graph so people could see like what we're talking about when we we talk about these exercises being the best because of that. And then we add in something like skill acquisition. It's like, okay, well, if it was just the highest skill ones, then you would say things like a clean and press or a snatch or movements like that. But then at one point there's diminishing returns because of the risk profile of it too so how, how do you it would have to be appropriate it's got to be appropriate like you, you're you know a, a clean and press or a snatch yeah but the problem i don't like with that statement sal is that like there's a lot of people that don't think a squat or a deadlift is appropriate for them yeah no because so i i, I hear what you're saying so a squat and a deadlift would be a prerequisite before you ever attempt uh sure. a clean and a press sure. mm -hmm. or, a, or a or a snatch so they are prerequisites and there's levels of exercises that, you know, could I take the average, you know, 40 year old and teach them how to do a clean and press? Maybe, maybe not, <laughs> probably not. If they've never worked out, they've never practiced, they've never really trained their bodies that way. It might never be an exercise that they could do. I could take the average 40 year old though, so long as there's no major injuries, stuff like that, and eventually get them to squat, eventually get them to deadlift eventually get them to do things like suitcase carries and farmer walks and overhead carries and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's got to be appropriate, of course. I mean, I agree with you. I'm just trying to find the best way to communicate it to the audience that, you know, let's say avoid squats and deadlifts because of that reason, but don't, and we're here, we are making the case for, you know, it's something that is a high skill, how important that is for the gains that you can get from it. Yet we're also saying, well, then I'm not encouraging you do yeah. a you know clean and press I mean, because well, it's too difficult. I don't think that I would discourage anybody from um, you know working their way towards that as yes. like a pinnacle uh, objective. And, and in terms of like what we started the podcast out with, like uh, to be able to practice and learn a skill, um, you place these these uh, achievable skills there first. So you do have to have the prerequisite. You do have to build your way up. You have to build up this support system, the stability, the type of mobility, the type of, um, you know, fast twitch power and strength uh, to even move, you know, that kind of a weight in it with that kind of acceleration. Uh, so you have to kind of segment that out and like uh, plot where those, those first objectives are. And so I think that like, in terms of like your your base exercises that we always talk about with your your um, backloaded squats, your your bench press, your overhead press, you know, bent over rows, like you know your sort of staple exercises. Those are like a real solid way to build like overall strength and have a, a solid uh, foundation uh, for you to then start to then. Uh, put your eyes towards an even higher goal of this like pinnacle of like 
a power move like that. Yeah, and I look, just I think it gets skipped. Like the these like major lifts get skipped. Yeah, look, here's the bottom line. Not everybody's gonna want to accomplish the most uh challenging, skillful exercises. That's fine. I don't care about that. What I'm saying is approach all exercises like skills. Take the most basic exercise, a curl. Treat it like a skill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not just you're working your biceps. It's a technique. There's a skill to the curl. Perfect the curl and you'll get better results. Perfect the shoulder press and you'll get better results. Perfect the leg extension, the leg curl. I don't care what exercise. The point of this is view exercises as skills. Go to the gym to practice those skills. Don't mm -hmm. go to the gym to work out. It's a very different mentality. If I'm going to the gym to work out, what I'm thinking is I want to get my chest sore and tired and I want to sweat. If I'm treating exercises like skills, I'm going to say, ooh, I want to really practice my bench press, my incline press, and uh, a cable fly, okay? I want to practice the technique of those exercises. That's going to get you better results. You guys know this. Look, if, you, if the average person went to the gym and said, I'm going to practice three exercises today and get good at them, and they just did that every time they went to the gym versus... I'm going to go to the gym and try and get a workout and sweat and get sore. Who's going to get better results? Yeah. yeah. The person perfecting and practicing skills. This is what the old time lifters understood. They did not look at an exercise. They saw the byproducts as side effects. Like, mm -hmm. wow, you get a really strong back when you do that exercise. You get really well-developed core when you do that exercise. But that was more of an observation after the fact. It was really about, I got to perfect yeah, the, the accomplishment was yeah perfecting yes. the lift and 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 being able to perform it then uh, in front of people. And That's so right. That was that was the 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 pure objective of them training in that direction. Yeah. By the way, look, I, I like to use running as an example because humans we didn't evolve really to have any physical abilities that make us like uh, competitive in the animal kingdom. I mean, we're smart, and so we're great tool makers. That's why we're at the we're called you know the apex predators, but we don't have claws. We're not generally very strong compared to other primates. We're not, uh, super fast or, 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 you know, we don't see at night. Like we're pretty useless, right? Like we get, we get eaten up and killed pretty easily. Uh, but one thing that we do have that we evolved with was our ability. And this is true. And I remember when I learned this as a kid, I thought this was amazing. Humans can out run, not for speed, but for distance or out trek almost any animal. Yeah. For distance. In fact, there used to be a famous race that was done. Maybe you can look this up, Doug, where they would take a human runner versus a horse. And it was a really long distance. Mm. And it was a toss up of who would win, the horse or the human. Obviously, the horse would take off faster, mm -hmm. but they'd have to stop. They didn't, you know, they don't sweat like we do. They don't have energy preservation like we do. And oftentimes the human runner uh, would win. And this is how hunter gatherers actually hunt. They would, they'll injure an animal yeah. with a down. spear and then they just, just follow it and run after it until the yeah, animal collapses. It falls uh, over. From yeah. exhaustion. So humans, and if you look at our anatomy, we have these really big knee joints. We have this really muscular feet uh, and mobile ankles. And we have these really big glutes. We are literally designed to walk and run consistently for long distance. This is what we evolved to do. And yet, if the average person goes and runs right now, they're going to get hurt. They're going to have injuries. Their knee's going to hurt. Their foot's going to hurt. We design all these crazy, you know, shoes and all this other stuff. Well, why? We just forget that we lose the skill. We stop mm -hmm. running when we're kids and we lose the skill. And then when people go and try and run, they don't practice running. They go run till they're tired, which, I mean, you do, if you don't know a skill, and you're trying to get good at that skill, the worst thing you could do is do it when you're tired. Yeah. Okay. If you don't know how to throw a basketball, you're going to throw a basketball even worse if you're super exhausted and I tell you to throw a free throw. So uh, this, is, this is just a great example of what I'm talking about. Strength training is no different. Every exercise that, you, that exists with strength training has a skill component. If you practice it as such, you'll get way better results. Yeah, do you think that's because of the over-glorification of like sweating and yes, burning yeah. calories? Yes. That's what they, because they both Fatigue's are Fatigue's like always the objective, yeah. Right, I mean, both lifting weights and running. I mean, I feel like that's the mindset that people get into it. Like you said, nobody ever laces their shoes up and goes like, oh, I'm going to go try and practice. Imagine if sports were played like that. Like, obviously with a sport, there's an objective. You know, you got to win the game, make the most points or whatever touchdowns. Imagine if you you went to play a sport and the coach was like, uh, just go until you're as tired as possible. 
Like, don't worry about it. I don't look. How do I throw the ball? No, no, no. Just throw it. Keep throwing as hard as you can. <laughs> throw it till your arm until your off. arm falls off. Like, how <laughs> shitty of a <laughs> of a game would you? I feel play? like there are coaches. Like I was gonna that, say. Dude. I'm sure it's been tried a few times. Yeah, 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 I'm dude. sure it's been tried. Those coaches few. don't go very far. Yeah. Right? Oh no, yeah, their team is not gonna perform well. That's for sure. I think so. I've I, were you guys like this? So I was like this when I when I got into lifting. I I was already like that, and I don't. I I attribute that to playing sports as a kid. It's like. You learn like, you know, when you're learning how to play any sport, you know, how to throw a ball, how to kick a ball, like how to catch a ball. There's there's a technique to it. Mm -hmm. And and like learning that is so is so. So you were really careful. That's why, about it. Yeah, I, uh, totally. And, and, and on that thread, like I, I think that's where the disconnect was for me as a trainer was because I ha always had that mentality of like, well, I want to learn you know, how to hold my body, how to like make sure like the, the actual leverage and everything is like on point, like the way I'm moving matters in this position. Like a lot of people that don't have that kind of a background of like being real disciplined about all those little nuances of how they move their body. It's just like, let's just get the thing up, yeah. you know? And so it's like, and you have to like really start stepping back and, and realizing like your average person needs a lot of steps before that to then understand that um, this is a, this, this is a practice this is a drill in a sense of learning the like you have to be able to control your body in such a way that this is going to be way more effective yeah I I when I first started working out it was this this is how far it went for me it was just how do I make this exercise? how do I get this exercise to feel it in the muscle I'm trying to work? Cause my initial introduction was bodybuilding magazines and bodybuilding books. I didn't learn that exercises were skills like I'm talking about now until I started to read about powerlifting because power lifters do this, right? They don't care where you feel it. I don't care if you feel it in your glutes or whatever, like can you squat the most weight? So for them, it's all about leverage and technique. Yeah. And when I studied power lifters, when I was much older, I was, you know, I started working out at 14, it's probably around 18 or 19 that I started diving into like power lifting technique. That was a, that was mind blowing to me, mind blowing. When I started doing that, the gains started going through the roof uh, from that. Whereas up until that point, it was just about how do I make it so that I can make it, I can feel it in this particular, which isn't t totally terrible, but it isn't as good as, you know, as what we're talking about right now. Yeah, so yeah. I missed out on the the loading and trying to get maximal strength. But I, I did do the technique thing really well, which is kind of funny. If I would have figured that out, also lifting heavy back when I was younger, I probably would have seen a lot more gains than what I what I did. But I definitely yeah. came in with the attitude of like, I mean, I was so extreme in that direction that I used to love to go lift weights uh, when I was all shredded and looked all good next to the guy who was lifting crazy weight and I lift a 10th of his weight, uh -huh. but looked like I was stronger or looked better than that person. Cause that's where my mind. That's so was. funny how you, how you yeah. flip it and feel good about that. I was the other guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to lift next to the bigger yeah. guy and lift more. Yeah. No, I, cause you know, when, when you're in the yeah. gym, atmosphere, I can see the value in either. Right. Right. Yeah. In, in the gym, like to everybody, you, you look at the buff guy, like rarely, I mean, maybe if you are into lifting really heavy or a power lifter guy, you might go like, you're more impressed with someone's weight. But I think that most people, look at the bodies and go they like, do. whoa, that dude's really impressive. Yeah. So I'd be in there with my wife beater or tank yeah. top or whatever. You know, they call them wife pleasers now, by the way. Do you know is that true? <laughs> yeah, they're trying to change That's the not name. true, is I it? I swear to really? God. Uh, they don't, nobody likes wife. ESG got a hold of them, huh? No, oh, <laughs> fuckers. Uh, <laughs> just, 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 of course. ESG made its way into Haynes, no, too. Yeah, huh? then they call it a <laughs> vape pleaser or something like that. Today's program giveaway oh. is MAPS Strong. If you're interested in winning... Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and then turn on your notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. Now, we're also running a sale this month. MAPS Anabolic Advanced is 50% off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Do you, by the way, yes, did you guys watch that video that I sent you guys? Yeah, on with how the crazy. Patrick yeah. You know, David. people are not aware of... Uh, the insanity of this. So for people to understand ESG stands for environmental, social, uh, social, uh, governance, well, governance. That's what yeah. it was. And so this is an organization comprised of some of the largest investors and companies, uh, in the world. And they give you a score based on your, you know, what you do for the environment and you know, what you could do for inclusivity and stuff like that. 
by the way, judged by them. So there's no like real objective, you know, clear, uh, you know, metrics or whatever. <laughs> and that score will get either get you more money from investors or less money from investors. So if you have a terrible ESG score, it's harder to get money. By the way, the, 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 the total amount of us, I think companies or, or investors that the amount of capital that they have who are part of this ESG is 88%. something. 88%. It's something. Yeah, well, yeah, almost 90% of the S&P 500 companies. Yeah. You're looking at almost $70 trillion worldwide, something like 400 trillion or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a way for governments and, you know, big players to influence companies um, that doesn't have anything to do with the consumer. So in other words, in the old days, you start a company and you either did well or didn't based on whether or not your consumers buy your product or not. Now you have to add on top of that, am I, what's my ESG score? Because otherwise I'm not going to get enough money or they're going to fire me or the board of directors is going to demote me or whatever. It's really crazy. Do you, it's like think it's, backwards. do you think it's rooted in good? No, I think they no. use good as a, exactly. as a guise. It's it's a it's a uh, it's clothing they wear yes. to to sell it uh, to um, the public and to companies and to uh, sort of appear a certain way. Uh, when in fact, because I, I I would I would think it, you know it sounds good, like it sounds like they're trying, you know. But if you go look at, at in terms of where money's been allocated towards any kind of environmental yeah. or kind of like uh, initiatives that they talk about. It's minuscule. Uh, so for me, like that's what it boils down to is like, you can say all the cool things you want, but if, if what, what really is happening is just a pure manipulation. Here's how you know. Okay. Elon Musk, who before he started speaking out and sharing his opinion, his company like Tesla would have had a great ESG score. I mean, it's the first, major uh, battery operated car innovations towards uh, reducing emissions and helping the environment. Then he, you know, he comes out and I guess he reps, ruffles feathers. He, Tesla has a ESG score that's lower yeah. than the other major car manufacturers and lower than BP, yeah. British Petroleum, an oil company. Yeah. How does that make sense? Yeah. How does that even, how does it even make sense? It doesn't. What it is is a a way for because with with markets the global control mechanism with markets it's like if you're a government it's hard to control companies and markets all you can do is legislate but you can't go in and directly tell them so what they did is they created this kind of like this 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 category it's like a credit score if you will and now they get they they can punish or reward uh, companies whether or not well it's up to them basically and so some people might say well what's wrong with that. Well, um, markets aren't perfect, but I trust millions of consumers more than I would a hundred very powerful people because, uh, you know, it's easier to have a hundred corrupt people than it is to have a million corrupt consumers or whatever. There so. seems to be a bit of a, a, a backlash happening though, right? So you, I saw McDonald's it came out and said that they would no longer be promoting it or talking about yeah. it. Um, now, there's also that they might be just saying that and then still trying to. Yeah. Run they might have just saw the way the culture is shifting and just. Yeah. Wanted, yeah. yeah. And you saw the article that Patrick Brett David shared about uh, LinkedIn that came out and said, like, the, you know, the DEI and CEI scores are hurting your companies and stuff like that. Which is all related. Yeah. That's, it's crazy to me. But it's like, what was D? I don't remember what that stood Diversity, for. Diversity, inclusive, inclusivity, or no. Initiative. Uh, initiative, right? Yeah. That was crazy because it would give a score to a company based off of uh, like mm -hmm. the physical appearance of their yeah, employees. Yeah. How, women, and how they black, identify. Mexican. Wow. Yeah, like that's okay. yeah. crazy. Yeah. You know, not crazy. merit, just no. how you look. This is so which weird. Which in itself is racism and sexist, which is yeah, ironic. It's so crazy to me. Well, those yeah. are your guiding descriptions. It's you know, like, forever, uh, uh, governments or people who wield power hate markets. It's always been that way because- uh, with, with markets, you don't have the power to tell companies what to do because the market's kind of determined. So they've always hated <clears throat> markets. Always. It's always been that way. Anytime a, a dictator takes over, that's one of the first things they do is shut down markets and take over, uh, companies or power or find a way to, 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 you know, control them. They hate them. They hate them. And this is one back kind of backdoor way yeah. of doing it. And again, markets aren't perfect at all. 
uh, because obviously consumers, I mean, you know, we, we, we know what we want. We don't know what we need type of deal, but, uh, greed, greed will catch them. But yeah, but you know, I, I, I have faith that greed will catch him. I, you know, I heard Justin talking before the podcast. Um, I think he's the only one besides me that watched the documentary on telemarketing. It's oh, called yes. telemarketing on HBO. Yes. So it really was great. Oh, dude. I honestly, I didn't even, I thought it was a mockumentary because these, um, the people in this documentary are such characters. It's almost like uh, a, a crazy version of The Office. But even crazier, right? Like even crazier because people are like doing drugs and like so. Basically, it's it's this whole group of like uh, ex cons, and you find out you know through this whole documentary why like all of these like ex cons are kind of getting hired for this telemarketing job. Which, to be very honest, it's a brilliant like crazy scheme and hustle that they came up with. Uh, but really, like so so their whole thing is to to basically sell. Um, uh, donations, just donations to, to police, um, organizations and, and, and basically like they get a, a sticker that they can put on their car or some oh, kind I've of validation yeah, for that. Yeah. I think everybody has, right? Yeah. Most people kind of remember that. Right. And, and it, and it extended from that. It was even like, you'd get a follow-up call if you donated anything by now a, um, fire, um, like a, a fire uh, organization that wants like, you know, the same type of donation and then like paramedics or, or whatever. They just had you kind of on a list indefinitely from that. But what you find out is like how much it was like, it started out as like 20%. They were so actually 10, 90, 10, bro. 10. Yeah. So, you so mean, 10%, 10% goes going to the actual to the firefighters or the police, 90% went to the, co the company yeah. who was collecting it. And they ran, a, they did this for like over a decade and were extremely successful doing it. And the one like hiccup where people would uh, like, oh, how, where, where is this going? Like people started to get kind of like, you know, savvy and, and realize that like the, this is like some other company. They're not the actual police I'm donating to. And so they actually went through the lengths of creating a, uh, a new LLC that had like police officer in the title so they can then say that they were oh, like the wow. police asked for them and then say yeah. that a hundred percent of the money goes, goes to goes to the, the police uh, the, officer the police association, yes. association oh. of yes. whatever yeah so <laughs> they, they literally get caught up from oh, greed so bro sweet. i mean they were they were killing it at the 90 10 split yeah. and 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 it was so how did they get in trouble so here's the way i think right there i mean they were totally misrepresented. so because i'm looking at it and i'm thinking if i'm the police you know if i'm let's say the police officers union or whatever i'm like well we're getting something rather than nothing that's how they got away Otherwise, with it. They wouldn't that's why they got away with it for so it. so long because yeah. it, 10 percent was still millions of dollars and then they get fined or whatever they get slapped with like a thirty five thousand dollar fine and they're like oh, okay and they pay it but then they wouldn't change and they would like ramp it up again and then they get like a $500,000 fine, plus and then they, they got, ramp it plus up Plus they again. got the cover of, let me guess, we're employing ex-cons. We're okay. giving them careers. So the job. brilliant part about that, and I'll check this hustle, right? So they they all have to, to make numbers, and this is like, you know, in order to have the job. And so they actually, like, targeted areas where there was, like, no work. And, like, there's a lot of, like, ex-cons. And, and so it was like, this was their only option. And so they're, like, hustling to, to get these sales. And if they weren't making their numbers, they did a dirty trick. They'd, like, call up their parole officer and be say like. Say they weren't working. Say they weren't working. And so they'd take them. And, and basically it was like a threat that, that was always there for them to, like, pull if, if they weren't, like, producing. Oh, wow. <laughs> Isn't that, that's yeah. so dirty. So if you're not getting enough donations, like, oh, uh, well, it looks like you're not doing your yeah, job. Yeah. Dude, and then, and they found out people were doing drugs and things and it, they're like, fine, whatever, just make the numbers, right? Wow. The, the guy that was doing the documentary was like a heroin addict and he was like, he was just like crushing. <laughs> it's, it's a great doc because <gasps> during this whole process, one of the guys had this idea of like, I'm going to, I'm going to document in this. So there's like real footage of all the stuff. So it's not like just a... I ha I I can't believe that telemarketing works still today. I know. It's so crazy. To I me. know. You have to be a I tell special you what, kind of I, persistent you know what? motherfucker. Yeah, no, you tell you what, if you when you watch Persuasion. this and you listen to the the script yeah. when it's when it's read, I mean these the guys who created it, right? They they, they That's joke what it is. The guys who wrote it and wrote the scripts and the plan were are brilliant. Yep. I mean like the 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 concept, the way you pitched it, I mean the way they open the phone call is like 
you know, like they, they're in a town, right? And there'd be, there'd be like two fallen officers in the last year. And they would yes, like, they'll use that. Oh yeah. Oh. This year, you know, oh, two officers. Sucks. Oh yeah. That's... So hit you right in your heart. Yeah. Like I'm listening to my fuck. I'd probably give it's 35 dirty. bucks. You know what I'm saying? And so, and then I've given money. I've yeah. definitely given money before. Courtney, like remember, that. she's the one that told me that she remembers she gave $10. Like it got, you know, the same hustle out of it. And then they followed her up like uh, three weeks later with the fire, uh, uh, like the firemen's whatever, yeah. like association. You know why I call, you know, I'm going to be a full disclosure. Two reasons why I gave money. One is I, I'm a huge supporter of uh, law enforcement, but also two, I wanted the sticker. Yeah. Because well, so they also use oh, that. Yeah. yeah. They were selling it yep. that you would get out of tickets. Oh, uh, yes. see, that's what I thought. Which is, yeah. I, I thought to myself, like, I bet if I had that sticker on my car, if I that's what I mean. Those. You think, I mean, you, <laughs> you think that you'd have to be a total sucker, but <laughs> yeah. it's, I mean, and, and then, you know, they start, they're smart. They start you off at like a small $25 or $35 yeah. donation. So you think, oh man, 25, 35 bucks, you get a police sticker on my, on my car and, and in my wallet that's going to potentially get me out of tickets. Like, oh, okay. You, you want to know who's relentless? Relentless with calling me is uh, the uh, um, Red Cross. Really? I donated blood. Oh, because you donated. <laughs> they want your blood. They want your blood. Because well, I'm type O. I have type O positive. Uh, like if I came down all the times you guys called me, I'd be dead. Apparently I got, <laughs> <laughs> you suck all the blood out Apparently, of me. Apparently I'm still regenerating. <laughs> yeah, Leave yeah. me alone. So, so I didn't know this. So if you donate blood, you have to wait a certain period of time before you donate again. They have like a policy. But if you have type O, then you wait much shorter. Because you're the universal donor. I right? have yeah. like special blood, right? Yeah. I got the blood that you could give to anybody. So as soon as I gave blood, I get a call from them. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. Okay, honest to God. Three to four days a week. Three to four days a week. No way. I swear to God, dude. And Even with all your STDs, mail. it doesn't, it doesn't wow, screw right? that you up. You still that in. They're that all doesn't, that's, oh, wow. Because yeah, I, I thought, got two of them that canceled each other. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's my theory. <laughs> <laughs> that's your theory. <laughs> <laughs> what a <laughs> shitty way to find out, right? You donate blood. Uh, yeah. Ah, you can't donate again. Yeah, okay. sorry. I wonder how often that's happened. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. That would be a horrible, like, shocker. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. They call me all the time. It's pretty crazy. Speaking of... Funny stuff. The comments. So I came in uh, sick, right? Had a fever. Came in, recorded an episode, and the comments. <laughs> sales are up. Say, hey, <laughs> hey, listen, hey, hey, sales are felt up. So bad for you. Like, <laughs> oh my god, so. Yeah, hey, well, first I'll off, buy, you buy a couple programs. Well, first off, people were treating it. I got some comments on there. Like, people are treating it like I like. I went to work and like, you know, like I'm a, like saving lives. You're a like, soldier, you know, yeah. dude. Like, man, <laughs> you came in and powered through <laughs> and you really, you know, for a second I felt proud of myself. Like I sat in a chair and I talked. <laughs> people, <laughs> people like forget or something, you know, like I swear, dude, like people are so soft now. Yeah. It's not, I guess that's like a badge. I'm like, I, I really almost, I did almost as much as I would have done at home, except maybe a little <laughs> less talking. Such a savior. Yeah. Guys. Like, man, but you, you were so in, uncomfortable. You powered through, you know, <laughs> Like yeah. my partners maybe come in. You guys, uh, you guys didn't get enough. You guys are the ones that should have gotten the compliment. Right? You guys yeah. sat next Nobody to me was, while I was yeah. breathing on you. Yeah, so. yeah. I know. But, but people were like, he looks so sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm so telling you, bro, sad. we had higher sales on the last two days because of that. So I'm, Everybody yeah. felt bad. Yeah, because I'm convinced we got some charity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> no, it was that. Uh, by the way, the reason why I was talking so quiet and sad was, yes, I was sick. But also because I was, if I knew if I ex pushed my voice out, I'd start coughing like crazy. So I had to talk like this and yeah. act like whatever. I know. You st I know. It's still lingering a little Ch bit, huh? A little bit. It's just, little bit. just a leftover congestion or whatever. One of the one of the nastiest ones you've had in a long time or what? Um, it's up. It's it's good. It's pretty good. I would say it's like a, it's a top 20, you know, <laughs> time I got sick or whatever. I've had some pretty bad ones. I look back at the text from last week. It sounded like it was the worst. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it, it, well, if I count all the, you know what? Yeah, you know the out. worst was? Doug calling you out, I dog. Know. <laughs> it was dramatic. The worst Very one dramatic. was uh, when I was in Thailand. I got food poisoning. That's oh, that was number bad. One. I remember that. That's the only time I ever thought to myself. Bad, bad food poisoning has to be up there with one of the worst feelings ever. I, if you get it really bad, really bad to where it's like you cannot, you can't take water down, you can't have oh, anything. Because it comes out everywhere. Well, you know what awful. part I didn't know about until that had the first, I've had it twice like that really bad that um, that I didn't realize was like would be so awful is when you just, everything is out of you like that, you're, you're so weak and frail feeling that laying on a bed hurt me. Everything. Yeah, like yeah. everything felt hurt. Yep. I was so uncomfortable. So like, yeah. you're so sick, you're so exhausted and tired, throwing up and you can't even lay in the bed 
and feel comfortable because the bed feels like you're laying on rocks. Yeah. It was such a weird, weird, weird feeling. So my to favorite be that part sick. of that whole thing is right because this is when Jessica and I first started dating, and she surprises me and buys these these tickets uh, to Thailand. She got a great price for them. By the way, we figured out why it was a great price because we had a 24 hour layover in China. Anyway, <laughs> flew with chickens. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> Let's say what? Like, and you flew with yeah. chickens. Yeah. It's like Indiana yeah. Jones Temple. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no, no, no. We, we flew in a regular Great plane. deal, honey. Yeah, yeah, no. We took a boat. No, we, we, uh, we, we, yeah, inflatable I, before rafts. we leave, I'm like a little unsure, right? So, so I'm like, wow, oh, I'm like, Thailand. I'm like, am I going to get sick? Or she's like, oh, come on. She's like, I traveled the world with Cirque and you'll be fine. Nobody gets, you'll be cool. You'll whatever. Of course, I get freaking hella bad food poisoning when I get there. Yeah. But I hallucinated. That's, I never had a fever to where I actually saw. I saw shit crawling on the walls, dude. I was uh, tripping out. It's not even the cool kind of hallucinating. No, yeah, not, get, not the fun kind. No. <laughs> it was the bad kind, dude. The and bugs. I'm in a I'm in a, a, a Thailand, you know, hotel and I'm like, oh God, this is real. Did you this lose your did you lose uh, taste and smell at all this go around? No. You didn't lose any no, of that no, stuff. No, no, no. Uh, Katrina says she's you know funny, like day four or five she did. So oh. later. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, she. I, I thought she was fine while we were out in Yosemite. And uh, in fact, I had to tell her she was going to. We were my best friends. Like, hey, we're going to get up at five o'clock tomorrow morning, and we're going to go do that six mile hike or whatever like that. And Katrina's like, okay, you know, we'll we'll play it by ear. But I think I'm feeling better, and I'm like, I don't think you should do that. Is she worse now, right now? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But like, uh, just fatigued. Yeah. She's really fatigued, and then the the taste smell thing all for her. So. Um, so yeah, now you gotta do more stuff at home. Yeah, yeah. She don't she don't do so well, bro. When she's when she's not feeling well. Did you say you put her in a room for like, just yeah, like a, yeah, for I an could. hour? So what? So when I first got COVID, right, I was Quarantine. the first one in our family. I was early too, very early on when everybody was still fucking scared to death, right? And you know, she locked me in the 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 spare master suite that we had at the other house. And like, you know, Lysol right by the door. So anytime I touch the door handle, she's spraying, spraying yeah. behind me. And it's like just over the top, bro. <laughs> and locked me in there for like seven days. I seven, remember yes. you, were, you were not yeah. liking it. Yeah. Seven days I was locked up in there. So sure as shit, she gets sick <laughs> this time, right? And so I tell her, I'm like, hey, we're going to have to quarantine you. I don't want Max to get this. You know what I'm saying? We don't want Max sick, right? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I know. I agree. She's in there for one hour, dude. One hour. I'm out there doing stuff with our son, cleaning the kitchen, making dinner for him, doing the laundry from our trip and stuff like that. So my phone's not on me. I come in like maybe after an hour or so like that, but check on her. So I'm going to go check on her, see how she's doing. And she's like, how come you don't have your phone on you? I'm in here locked up all day. I'm like, whoa, dude. I'm like, dude, this, that, so like that. She, I mean, she totally apologized afterwards. It was hilarious to see her like that because she's never I like, remember. Dang, you should have like called us and we could have got you like some zombie makeup or something. So <laughs> yeah, you're just like, oh, it's happening. Yeah. I'm changing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you've been in here for one hour. I said, I was in there for seven days. Like, yeah. do your time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you. You were Solitary in there because you were texting us when you were locked, you know, you were in that room and you're like, oh, it's killing me, man. I hear Max playing out there. I can't walk outside the room. Yeah. I'm locked in here. I've watched everything on Netflix. I don't know what to do. Oh, my God. What I tell you what, it's, it's funny. Uh, you, That's but, way brutal. Yeah. It, 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 it's probably one of the worst parts of, of, about it was that, was the isolation. I thought was like really, really bad. Just interesting how like we're such social creatures yeah. and until you... Or for and there's something about like hearing it too. Like I bet if I was like on some retreat where I'm supposed to be by myself or like that, it'd be like meditative and I could read and it could be choosing to be alone. Is yeah. that the same as being? Forced? Yeah, feel that's like the part forced. that makes it like yeah. so terrible. It's for like sure. I'm in there and I could hear everything else going. I'm like, this is fucking terrible. <laughs> they're they're pretending to have fun on purpose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. He Max did, did something for the first time. Oh, you missed. It. He was juggling. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> oh, this is so crazy. Uh, speaking of oh, kids. Speaking of kids, so my oldest uh, he cleaned out his room because he's going to be going off oh, to college. Oh, boy. How much be, did you cry? I'll be empty nester guy. I'll huh? be driving him up to, you know, taking him to school to help him move in over the weekend. So I sat, you know, he came over for dinner, got the last of his stuff, right? And uh, then he went to his mom's house and I sat in his bed, dude, and totally just flat just go i just went through the oh yeah i remembered him when he was little oh, brutal growing up yeah. i remember oh and i'm just sitting in his room just feeling so what's sad be best and worst part about it uh best i don't know if i could i mean best one less teenager in the house probably good 
I mean, that's got to be positive. <laughs> it's also going to be positive, like your son made it. He's a very smart kid, right? Yeah. Of course. A, no, right? no, no, I mean, no, no, no. A, All joking like, aside. It'd be way worse. He's 18 and he's like, hey, I'm going to be here for another 10 years because yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. have a job or fucking, I'm a dummy. Hey, that's, the, <laughs> that's the Italian way, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you sure you want to leave? Need my allowance, you know. Like, yeah, so time. best and worst. Yeah, no, that's, that's of course. I'm proud of him. I'm very proud of him. And he's, you know, he's going to go off and, to, and, and grow and learn. That's awesome. Worst is, man, it's, you're, it, it, that's it. That's it. Like the time you spend, what's that statistic? That one hit me. Ninety percent of the time you'll spend yeah. with your kid happens before the age of what 18. was it? 18. Yeah, yeah. zero to eighteen. Zero to eighteen is ninety percent of what you will spend, or it was like even higher than that. I don't remember. I have it in my phone because it like hit me so hard. Yeah, I mean you're always yeah. going to be there. You're always obviously be a part of, but it's not like it like it was when they were little. So it's just he's going to be out. He's going to be out on his own. And uh, now I'm going to be. I remember when I moved out. I was older. I was twenty one, and. Uh, I remember my my mom calling me every day. This yeah. was for like the first month. She'd call me every day. How you doing? Whatever. And she would cry every day. Oh my God. And and I was, you know, as a kid, you're always like, oh, come on, mom. Like, you know, whatever. Yeah, like it's, uh, like it's not that you know, bad. you're like, I'm so, I love you, mom, whatever. Now you get it. Now you yeah, get it. right. Now I get it. Dude. Yeah, yeah. And also I get the whole like, the parents like, you never call me. You never yeah. call me. Yeah, my yeah, parents yeah. still say that to me. You never call us. You never call us. Now I'm a parent. Oh uh, yeah. Because okay. I know it's going to happen. It's going to be gone. If yeah. I don't call him, I guarantee he's not going to. I get it. You're out doing your thing. I remember. What How old were like. you when you went out, right. Justin? Um, so let's see. I came, well, after I came back from college, um, I think I only stayed there for like a year. So it was like, I was probably, so yeah, I was left probably at 20. So you left when you were 18. Yeah, I was probably about 20. <laughs> came back uh -huh. and I left again. Yeah. What yeah. about you, Doug? I actually went to uh, school locally. So I stayed with my parents during that time. Till you were 40? <laughs> 40 year old virgin 38 uh, no actually uh, until I was like 20, 21 or 22 when I graduated okay so all the time about the same but age. I had to you know, I had to cover every expense my school my car my everything yeah so back then a just, car was 25 cents did, now did your guys' parents <laughs> did, you, did your guys' parents make you do anything like that so when you came back after college you know, oh yeah and, and then so did you have to pay for everything yeah, yeah. they weren't they weren't yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I paid for college everything yeah. you have to yeah that'd be weird Hey, no, glad, of, welcome back from college. No, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people don't, bro. A lot kids, of parents, yeah. a lot of parents. If you, they, they still take care of them. Yeah. Andrew, how old were you when you were out? Uh, seventeen for college, and then came back, and then I was out, got my apartment. I think 21, 22. How long were you back home with mom and dad after you came back from? Probably like six months. Oh, just six yeah, months. Yeah, I could. Uh, yeah. Now you were out early, right? Yeah, seventeen. Yeah. I tried to get out of sixteen. <laughs> they called the cops on me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Found that out real quick. Can't run away till you're eighteen. I didn't yeah. know that was a fucking law. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> I'll never forget coming down to the police station like that, being like, "Uh, my parents threw me out of the house, and then they called the cops on me and said I was a runaway. Um, I'm just here to let you guys know that I'm not. I didn't, yeah. you know, I didn't run yeah. away. They threw me out of the house, like, and so, and they're like, "Yeah, sorry, kid. Doesn't work that way. Wow. Doesn't matter what they say. <laughs> you're fucked. Hey, how you're frustrating." Eight. That because that's so illogical, right? As to a kid, right? You're like, oh, you're like sitting down with them, like, hold on, let me get this straight. You kicked me out, yeah, yeah. and then you call the police on me because yeah. I'm out of the house. Yeah, can you please explain this? Yeah, yeah. I remember that, and then the the lecture from the cop when they actually came down and arrested me and stuff. And I remember him telling me like, and I remember like crying right uncontrollably and being like, but nothing is nothing is from them. My, I bought my bed. I bought my TV. Yeah. Wow. I bought my this bed. She's stuff. Yeah. And then I remember him being like, yeah. And they can light it all on fire and you can't do a goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, like, or they could sell it. They can give it away, donate it. This you is can, tyranny. And I'm like, what? No, they can't. <laughs> like, yes, they can. The beginning until of the, until be you're 18, this, everything you think is yours is technically there. I'm like, dad, this is some fucked up bullshit. A lot, <laughs> a lot of your political attitudes make sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I thought yeah. I lived in America. Right, this is communism, bro. This is communism. This is bullshit. <laughs> oh, oh, you mean our stuff, yeah, Adam? Yeah, oh, this is yeah. our stuff. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Now yeah, you get it, right? So yeah, yeah, no, I tried to be out by 16. Your and then when I was 17, and because I was young for high school, so I was gonna graduate high school at 17 before I turned 18. My parents realized like I was like just I was on a mission to not speak to them for like the last year of like living there. Cause I was just like, okay, this is how we're how gonna long did you last, by the way, without saying a word to them? Dude, I lasted months. 
I really, oh my God. yeah, I did. I lost it. I think that's, oh I think that's why they finally broke was because it was legit like that. Like, They're I like, he'll talk to us yeah. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I think they really thought yeah. that. And I was just, I mean, I, did I mean, you write notes. If you well, you know how I am. Like yeah. I'm like, I put my mind to something. Like I decided I'm like, that's, I was like, I'm not speaking to them for a year. That's was, the one thing I could do. <laughs> it's the one power. You have, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. all I had. How did you communicate? Did you write notes? Like, no, I mean, it? I, if they, if they asked me direct quiet, it wasn't like, I was like, no, it was absolutely but I'm not engaged. Yeah. So we had family dinner every night. I'd just be nothing you know what i'm saying versus i was a loud kid right i was loud talking you know like so for me to make that switch it was definitely challenging but i absolutely had that attitude of like i'm not speaking to these guys until and when i'm out <laughs> you'll never see me again i remember telling them that like when i as soon as i'm 18 and i'm out of prison i said um, i'll never come back i'll never talk to you oh man i was so upset and then towards the last like year of high school and as i was when i was 17 I think they realized like how serious I was. They really realized they, like they called your bluff, but you weren't bluffing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so then I think they started to like loosen up. Then all of a sudden they were like, Oh yeah, you know, just check in with like my curfew all of a sudden got extended and they started being all cool. And then when I was talking about moving out and looking for a place, my mom was like helping me look for places and stuff. So I was like, Oh, okay. Which was a smart play. Cause who knows what would have happened if they would have fought me all the way till, I left. I'm crazy like that where I might be like, I'm never coming back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so. No, my, my mom called me every day crying. Then when they would come visit, she would <clears throat> bring food, like Tupperware's food. <laughs> She'd do my laundry. Yeah. She saw me vacuuming. She started crying. Yeah, you didn't learn how to do laundry till yeah, Jessica, right? Ahead. No, 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 no. Before that. Get out of here. I, I, had, I moved out on my own. Huh? I had to live on my own. And when I was in, You didn't just buy new school. clothes every week? No, yeah. <laughs> more disposable <laughs> clothes? <laughs> Paper plates. It was a bachelor plate. move for sure. And paper pants. Yeah. No, dude, I had to learn. On plates. I, I had to learn because I lived in Palm. Remember, this is down in Palm Desert when I owned that gym. So yeah. I remember I went to the to, to the grocery store. I never washed clothes or did. I don't know any of this stuff. So I bought like 15 different detergents, went down to the laundry, you know, laundromat. And I sat there and I read the instruction. I looked at everything. I don't know what to do. Luckily, a lady next to me noticed and she's like, can I help you? So I never, I never done this before. <laughs> She's like, I here's said, the on button. What do I put in there? How much water? Like, how do I add the soap? <laughs> like, what's going on? Dude, I so would she, love to be a fly on the wall. Yeah, so she helped me out. Hey, I, had a, I had a thought. So and then out. I realized people lied. You don't have to separate your clothes. You can throw them all in. They come out just fine, <laughs> oh, everybody. Dude, dude. They come out just That's fine. That's a sin. Katrina yeah. does that. Yeah, I get so <laughs> uh, much trouble. Yeah. All right, so I had this thought uh, the other day, and I wanted to ask you guys, because um, something happened. So hopefully you guys can come up with a, a, a thing. Is there anything that you swore you would you never would do or didn't think could ever see yourself doing until you became a parent. Then, then you found yourself doing that. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, I got to think about that. Can you think Ooh. of something like that where like, you're like, no, I was never, I'd be like, never, am I going to do that? Never. And then you become a parent. Then all of a sudden you catch yourself doing that or being that way. Can know. you think of a situation like that? I mean, I'm, there's a lot, of, I'm sure there's a lot of things that I can't think of. Stuff <clears throat> What about you? I'm sure this. Yeah, well, well, yeah. This, what, what, why this happened was I was, and it was, it was literally like a, uh, just a, a natural react. I did it. And then like, I caught myself and I went, Oh my God. I remember thinking, seeing somebody do this when I was younger and being like, that's so disgusting. I would never do that. Like, I'm never going to do that. And that is like seeing your, your kid, right. We're, we're in the hot tub, right. So just him and I in the hot tub, we're hanging out. And you know, whenever he gets like a, a little booger nose, I just reach oh, over there. With, just grab I just, oh, yeah, reach, just wipe it off reach over there with your hands and you oh, <laughs> that's where you're going. squeeze okay. it, squeeze yeah. it out and then just yeah. throw it on the ground. Oh, yeah. or what? And I remember yeah. thinking like seeing that for the first time when I was like a teenager or a young kid, we're like, Oh my God, it's fucking disgusting. Yeah. I would never do that. And then finding myself just doing it without even like subconsciously, like you saw it. Oh, my son, I just oh, yeah. I get it. Mm -hmm. And I do it. That's like, a good one. Isn't that, yeah. uh -huh. isn't that like, one how of about this one? Have you done this where you see something on your kid's face or their hair sticking up? You, you lick, lick your, it. Yeah. Lick it. Yeah. Yeah, lick. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me wipe that off on my spit. <laughs> Is it, you know, what's crazy about it or what I thought was so interesting about that moment where I caught myself doing that is that it wasn't like I had this, uh, where I stopped and went, Oh, what do I do? You know, or should yeah. I do it or it. yeah, you just do it. And then after the fact, you go like, oh my God, that does, was something that I said. Does Katrina have this device? Apparently it's popular with moms. Jessica uses it and I, it's the most oh, it's disgusting. The it's the most disgusting uh, thing I ever. can't even, so she has one? Yeah, it's called a- What uh, the f it's hell called, it's called is it wrong pot? with moms? Is it the bulb? Is it the name? No, 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 no the bulb is, bulb no, is fine. Bulb is it's, fine. The, it's, the, it's the sucking uh, one. Oh, yeah, yeah. It no, has no. a filter. It's got a, it's a tube Jesus. and it's got a plastic tube it's attached, a, to, uh, attached to it. It's not a neti pot? No, bro, you literally suck with your mouth. Come on, Andrew, you gotta know the name of this. I don't know, but it's- It's like how you siphon gas. 
Yes, it's called. Does a, your does your does your wife use it too? Yeah, she uses it all the time. Uh, I think it's Frida mm. Baby. Oh yeah, Nose Frida. Nose Frida. That's what, what it is. It's a hell? Nose Frida, and Katrina oh, does no, it. Do and that. it to me, oh, I'm like, I cannot. Now the the boogers don't go in. It the doesn't. Tube in your mouth. It doesn't. But, but it doesn't the matter. Of it. It's just the action mm. of it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's the action of it that I cannot. Bro, I leave the room. I can't get behind it. I can't. <laughs> yeah. It's got to be a mom thing. It is. Yeah. It's got to be because Katrina has no hesitation to do it. Yeah, doesn't bother her at all. Come here, and she's just. I can't even. I can't even watch it. It's, talking about yeah. it right now is making me so. Yeah. I, so that's weird, right? Because I don't. I just did. I did the thing with my fingers. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah. Don't even yeah. think about. It. But watching you suck through this nose, Frida. What the hell? And and disgusting. And seeing, it is disgusting. Gross. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Uh, I, here's what else is gross. We I got an Amazon package the other day. Jessica opens it up. She's like, "It's finally here." I'm like, "What is that?" It's this weird black tube. She opens it. <laughs> and there's all these like metal, weird looking. Looks like a surgery kit or something. I'm like, what is that? She's like, oh, it's for popping pimples and stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. what? A popping pimple kit? Bro, yeah. she, bro there's like 15 Cor has one of those. It's like weird it, devices it in there. Digs in to lift it up first. What? And then like. Okay. This okay. is a thing? Yes, bro. This is a girl thing, 100%. They watch too much uh, Dr. Pimple Pop. I swear, this is how you know we're, we're primates. Because yeah. it's like when you pick the, you know, whatever, the, the ticks or, lease or, or the lice. Yeah. She gets, she's so excited. Take your shirt off right now. I'm like. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, honey. I'm like, hold on a second. First of all, you're okay, trying. Okay, do you have to, like two or three that that are always like, like, oh, this is like my well, and she just like targets <laughs> it. There's always one like here on my back, and I'm like, dude, bro, listen, is that it? Sour? Yes, thing? it's like a surgery kit. Yes, yeah. dude. Yeah, it's actually it. it's that one right Courtney there. Courtney has the same thing. It's the one in the middle. Pimple pop. It's called a yes. pimple popper tool kit. Tool kit. I didn't even ten know piece. I did not even know this was a thing. It's Gross. Well, it's only fourteen ninety nine. Lucky you. I, and so I didn't even know that pimples were that unique that you need ten different tools potentially. I didn't either. She was so excited. We almost got an argument. She's like, no, "Take your shirt off and lay on your stomach." I'm like, "No, I'm not gonna do that." She's like, "For me, please do it. I want to yeah. do this so bad." What? So I laid on my stomach and she went to town. And she's like, "Look at this blackhead. Look at this black." I'm like, "I don't yeah. care. What are you doing? Look at these Whoa. ingrown hairs like an attack. Yeah, you know, and it hurts." Oh. Nasty. Isn't that gross? Okay, let's change this up. <laughs> <laughs> Disgusting. Yeah. All right, no, let's talk my, about Well, you guys didn't hear mine, but. Oh, yeah, so what do you got? It, 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 it's kind of wild. <laughs> it's, it's a dick, dude. It's kind of wild. So typical. I even forgot what I was. No, you didn't. I, I did. I okay, didn't no, did you, was, for, you didn't forget, did you? No, I didn't forget. Oh. It, for me, it was, it was, I had this like hard rule that like when Courtney was pregnant, like when, you know, she's going to go through the whole process, like. I was going to be like at the top part and like, you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm here for like comfort, whatever, like oh, whatever upper, you body need, upper body support. Like I'm not going to be like visibly like, you know, in the receiving end of it and yeah. all this and like through the whole hustle of the whole thing. And like we had a doula there and like, she was kind of manipulating me and like kind of moving me. And then the doctor was like, Oh, come here, look at this. And like, I'm there and all of a sudden I see the whole thing and I'm like, and then they had me cut the cord and they had me hold like, all these like <laughs> the placenta and I'm like looking at all this stuff. I was like, I told, I told all of you, I wasn't going to do it. Either. <laughs> and then it happened. Oh. Oh. I remember that one too, actually. It was I a hustle. I remember dude. saying that I wasn't going to do all that stuff. And I did all that. None too. of it. I, I thought, but the it whole, didn't, it didn't. Yeah. It wasn't anything like I expected. I, the so. whole process, uh, especially with Dahlia, cause we did that at the birth center. It was just one of the most amazing experiences of my entire life. But, the placenta delivering is always yes. what the hell is that? I didn't want. I didn't need to see. What that. is that? No, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Didn't need to see it. I know. Great transition. Have you guys had Legion's new cookies? <laughs> <laughs> I love that commercial, Doug. That's hey. horrible. You that's ate, horrible. Uh, <laughs> hey, the I mean, do it taste like nutrients? Hey, no, hey, hey, speaking of placentas, you know what else is like high minerals? minerals. Oh, oh, great okay. transition. Uh, hey, listen, you uh, ate uh, all of them. That's a. Yeah, you ate I all of them. I did. I did. <laughs> all the good. They were good. So I don't. I'm not a big fan of the bars as much, even though I did eat some of those uh, not that long ago. The uh, the cookies I like. Mm. I do like. So the how many grams of protein is per cookie? Uh, I believe it's ten. Did, oh, is no twelve or fifteen? Isn't it? I don't know. You think it's only ten? I think it's. Look 10. them up, Doug. Yeah. Look up Legion Protein Cookie. Mm. Yeah. Well, so they're good I, then. You saw I stole yeah. like all the rest of the uh, protein powder out of the back. Like Everett's eating me out of house of the my stash. So he's is like he taking shakes. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, he's into it now. Like, uh, I've is he you, whey or is he doing the vegan whey? Yeah. Yeah, he's doing whey. Oh, they're uh, the dairy family, bro. He's fine. Oh, he's I stand fine corrected. It. it is fifteen. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna no. say. Wow, that's a good would, amount. Yeah. Ten yeah. would be terrible. And how many yeah, calories is the whole cookie? Uh, two sixty. That's not bad at all. Mm -mm. So you can eat two of them and mm -hmm. have a nice nice. They're actually uh, good. 
They are. I good. like them because they're chewy. That's why I like them too. They're not like all crumbly and so that they're they're chewy, so they're mm-hmm. good. I like oh, them. That's, that's I'm not a big like protein bar fan of that much, and that, I thought those were pretty good. So shout out to Legion. What's for the that one. What's the product that you use most of all of our partners most consistently? Is it the because I see you every there's morning? A, there's a lot. There's a lot of things that I use really consistent. I almost always have creatures of habit for breakfast. That's the that's, one I see you using every morning here. Yeah, that's. I mean. I would say there's a lot of things I use every, every day. I use our sleep eight every single night. I use. I'm our, not with I, you at night, so I don't see that. Yeah, so, well, creatures of habit. I use. I use my Caldera stuff every single day. Um, Magic spoon, like on a semi, like every other day or a couple days. I have Magic. How, spoon. how regularly do you eat the creatures of habit? Every day. Every single day. Yeah, pretty much. Like right now, like it depends. Like I'll be on kicks, right? So I've been on this kick of having oatmeal to start my day. Um, and I, I notice a difference when I do. I just feel better. It kicks. It actually kicks my appetite up. So I like it for that reason. So like I can easily skip breakfast and go all the way till like two o'clock and eat the first time. If I do that, I, I'm playing catch up with protein. Mm-hmm. And so one of the first things that I have to do is is be disciplined to make. And I'm not always going to sit down and make myself like a, you know, or order like you're doing steak and 12 eggs. So if I'm not going to do that, then a quick creatures of habit, just add water with 30, 30 to 32 grams of protein. I also see, I see the editing team uh, eating uh, the creatures of habit pretty regularly too. I love it. Yeah. I I mean, I I really think Mike hit it out the park with, with that. I mean, it's, it was something that I did uh, consistently when I was competing anyways, was making my own version of it. So to be able to have it already pre-packaged and then and to go and i've told you guys too that i've uh, messed with all like the cookie recipes so they make pretty good high protein cookies Uh, so i do that all the time too so that's kind of a staple for us so like if i had to like because everyone knows i have a sweet tooth right so i i probably toggle back and forth between the homemade creatures of habit cookies that katrina makes and we keep in the refrigerator or magic spoon Mm. and if i have those to have act like if I did, haven't ran out of a box of cereal and if I haven't ran out of my uh, creatures habit cookies, that's good. Like I'm, I'm cool. I don't need, I don't, I don't need to go get like a, a sugar kick or something like that. It gives me enough of that sweet. And then I'm also getting a protein kick with it. So, but if it's not, then, mm. you know, then I'm like anybody else. I was going to ask you, Adam, because I'm, sh- I'm sure you read this. Did you see what UPS drivers are going to be making? Now? Yes. That was on my notes like last week. Did you hear about this? No. So they just had their, they just, it was right before we, we all take left a guess. How much do you think UPS drivers make now? Well, they just had their union thing, right? So they yeah. fought for their wages. What do you think? In terms of like a per year salary? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Year. For you a drive a UPS time. truck, deliver stuff, you know, I the mean, whole thing. I, I would imagine like 50 to 75. 175. Woo! 175 an hour? For you know, 175,000 a year. Oh, I, I, for okay, a driver? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's a full-time driver now going forward when they're, this contract falls off. So they're like, like they have their own union, right? Just like yeah. nurses and everybody else. And they just had their big like renegotiation. And what was know, the, what were they paying before? Paid. It was like a 50% increase. Oh, Yeah, wow. it was a big jump. It was a big jump. So, so I have a little bit of a speculation on this. <clears throat> I, I, th- I think when self-driving cars become like a thing, thing uh, everywhere, the first places that we'll see them take over will be for deliveries, uh, especially long deliveries. Well, well the problem yeah. with UPS is who's going to take the package out and, and well, the, take it to the. Well, I mean, you have the self-driving car, drones. and then you, yeah, you'll probably just have drop it to the out. house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll probably Maybe. drop it off. Well, they already have like the drone things that they've been yeah. doing for a minute, so you'll yeah. just have like a drone drop it drop in the front door yeah. with that. Oh yeah, that's coming. That, and that, I, I, so I'm wondering if they're like, just like launches of course that. that's <laughs> the first transition. Like you're not going to risk humans in there. Like you're like you're going to mess with drones flying packages. Yeah, where it's it a, might be like you have to meet up with the actual vehicle, right? So you got to like you schedule it so it like parks, and you got to go get your package uh, yeah, from the back or something. Over. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's. I a, would wonder how they would do that without a human, but well, that's a that's a tremendous salary. I had that's it such is. a big that's, that's a, a that's, that's a big jump. Most yeah. people don't make a hundred grand a year. Uh-huh. Uh, that's one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Yeah, one seventy five was. I, I saw it too. My jaw hit the floor. You used to have to be a district manager of twenty four hour fitness. Making well, you know what's weird like that too. You know what I looked up too. Like, uh, what do you guys think? Like the average lawyer makes. Uh, well, there's a wide range. Lawyer, yeah. On the okay. Say, How about this? Killers and there's... look at the top. What do you think the average top ten percent of lawyers make? 
I would guess at least two hundred grand a year. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's. Yeah, I would have thought way like, more than that. Like Top ten percent of lawyers, yeah, almost like five. I would have thought like half a, half a million to a million, yeah. but it's actually no. It's like one eighty to two fifty. Look up the law. I saw what the average lawyer made, and it was like under two hundred, which I thought was crazy low. And then you know what, man? I was watching Suits. My or Katrina's all into Suits right now. And so I, I I was looking up like what all the average stats were. What do you got for me, Doug? You pull it up. Yeah. So the median annual wage for lawyers was one hundred twenty seven thousand in twenty twenty one. The lowest ten percent earned less than sixty one thousand. The highest ten percent earned more than two hundred eight thousand. Isn't that okay. crazy? That's yeah, it? but I bet it's exponential. Like the top five percent is probably a big jump. You know what I mean? I would guess. Like a Johnny Cochran has to or something. Be. I mean, the top okay, 1% are probably taking But I just thought that was really millions. interesting because it's, it's it, most people think like, oh, doctor or lawyer, you're going to be rich. But like, you know, bro, you know what? Lawyer. Breaking 200 grand a year. But people think lawyer, there's such, there's so many different kinds. Like there's patent attorneys, there's right. trial lawyers, there's divorce attorneys. Like uh, that'd be like saying doctor, average doctor. Well, there's, yeah. general practitioner and then there's like a surgeon or you know so there's got to be a wide range in that sense so I mean, everybody's I put together i mean i still thought it was alarming i just would have not i would have never guessed and after going to all that school yeah and yeah yeah spending that much money and on so you're, you're talking about a, a, an overwhelming majority of them that go through all Doug, that look up top 10 percent of entrepreneurs there's something that might not be advertised much. What do you guys think? You think it'll be more than lawyers? Top ten percent? Of course. Of As yeah. a, a top ten percent? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's going to be way I mean, more and than doctors. That. What do you think I number is going to be for top ten percent of entrepreneurs? Uh, Half a million? Yeah, I think that's a good guess. Mm, Three hundred and something. Yeah. Three fifty average. These stats are not the problem so with that. Though, Sal, available. The problem with um, that is that one of the, one of the benefits of being a very a quick successful drop off too. Well, one of the biggest benefits of being a very successful entrepreneur is all the tax benefits and the way you can structure your company for your livelihood. So, there's probably a lot of entrepreneurs that have a say million dollar business. They take a hundred thousand dollar, eighty thousand dollar year salary. Is different than their but assets. They, yeah, but then they they have structured their car and their housing and their mm. travel and like so much of their like their life through the business. And so you know, on a stat like that, it's gonna it's gonna reflect what they're paying taxes on. Mm. But in reality, they're they're probably benefiting. I'm on a I'm on a website. I don't know. It's Career Explorer. And this is entrepreneurs can earn an average yearly salary of $43,000. That's average. Um, and then it says top level entrepreneur earnings, which is the 90th percentile. So top 10%, 133,000 per year. That's which is skewed though. I t I'm telling you right now, like if you, if you are a, an entrepreneur and you have a business that is, that is clipping away at a half a million or a million plus a year, mm -hmm. you're, you would be dumb to pay yourself four hundred thousand dollars a year, you'd be much better paying yourself a low salary. Yeah. That's and, a huge pool too. and structuring. Plus, what's in that I mean, pool? Like, is it like yeah? There's, like, there's, do you sell Amway? Encompasses yeah income? anything exactly. Like like any type of business, I would assume would lump in there. Yeah. So, I don't so know. yeah, that's yeah. kind of like yeah, yeah. That's yeah. You're not rough. gonna get the real number reported for that. That's it's different when you have a W two wage where you can go check like for uh -huh, sure this uh -huh. is what this law firm that's is paying true, that's this person. Point. So it's. But an entrepreneur, there's so many more benefits. You know too. who makes a lot? Petroleum engineers. Have you ever looked up their numbers? That's a random thing to look up. Uh, yeah. So why, like, why would you look up that? How did that? Come I up? remember I read an article. Doug looked that up. So like, average <clears throat> petroleum engineer at one point was one of the highest paying jobs. Um, and these are people that uh, figure out how to get more oil and and you know how to work with oil and stuff like that. Apparently make a shit ton of money. Uh, eighty-two to two hundred grand a year. Average. Average. Yeah, yeah that's average. That's Here's the UPS thing. So they'll make an average of forty-nine dollars per hour, which works out to be about one hundred two thousand dollars a year. Yeah, but that's but they get fifty thousand in benefits, which includes health, welfare, and pension contributions. Oh, still. you're also you're all yeah, but yeah. I think you're also are you averaging the part time people in there with that? No, this is full, full time. time. This is full time. So the fault, the hundred seventy number is a little bit. It's like, oh, they're not getting one hundred seventy thousand dollars in like pure salary. Yeah, but pension plus benefit. I mean, it is. It's all. It's all money. Uh, well, yeah, it's all money in the end. Amazon, or they. I wonder how close they are to that in terms of what they offer. You know, their drivers and whatnot. All right, so I got a shout out for you guys. I don't think he needs a shout out because he's blowing up out of nowhere. Um, Oliver Anthony. That. Oh yeah. That. So I am not. 
I love his music. Not I'm not a country fan. Yeah. I, I just not, not my favorite kind of music. I started to enjoy it a little bit when we went to Tennessee and I, we watched that live uh, performance because uh, when you watch it live, it's like totally different. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Oliver Anthony is making the news and it's the lyrics that caught me. It's very soulful. It's, a, it's like a bluegrass kind of great vibe. Too. Bro, yeah, he really does a good. song, I think it's called Feeling Pretty Good. And then another one about I want to get sober. I want to get sober. Oh my really God. Good. It's yeah. like, you don't get the chills. It is like, he is so pained and just so cute to see you come over to the light side. dude. <laughs> good to have you over here. Eventually I'll get the heavy metal guy too. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> it's all, it's, it's, it is, it's all about the lyrics with country. Isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. if that's where they got soul, that's where I'm going. So yeah, yeah. yeah. but he's, he's, he's great, great music. I'm like, I said, I'm not a fan of that kind of music normally, but I saw Rogan shared him. And then I've actually seen a lot of big pages actually share that. That thing went viral mm. over, overnight. Organifi makes organic supplements for wellness, health, and athletic performance. Right now, they have this bundle that combines pure with a high performance pre workout type supplement called Peak Power. Combine the two and get euphoric, creative energy. And again, it's all organic. Go check it out. Go to organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump and get 20% off. All right, back to the show. First question is from Johnny W. Branscum. What can I do to get more roadmap veins? I have a lot of veins, but I want the ones in my forearms to stick out more. What should I do? I'm already sub 10% fat. Uh, take a pump and use sodium. Is there any way to get even more? Oh, Genetics, is this, is this a real desire? Yeah, so yeah, cool. people is. love you it, want, dude. You want to be all veiny? Chicks yeah. love it too. Really? Yeah, especially if you're a nurse. How do you, you not know this? You have a nurse wife. Yeah, yeah but they like the fact that yeah, it's like easy. it's easy to to apply. Uh, yeah, like um, shots or whatever. But like, yeah. <laughs> like, what's the other benefit? Is my thing. Like, why? Oh, look, she's lying to you. She's not even telling you, bro. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna ask her right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I this is weird. I picked this because it's a weird question. Well, uh, first off, yeah, the, people love it. To this person, to the specific person who's already sub 10% body fat, takes sounds like pump supplements. I think what's worth trying to say uses sodium. Uh, I mean, no, there's not much else you could do. I mean, genetics plays a large role. Like I have. I have veins in my shoulders. Genetics play the, genetics play the biggest role. Yeah. Genetics and then body fat percentage. I mean, you see pro bodybuilders on stage without a lot of veins who are lean as hell. And then you got other guys who get the crazy looking varicose veins in their legs, which is disgusting. <laughs> yeah. So robbing veins. Everywhere. Yeah. I mean, but generally it's getting lean, being well hydrated. Those are the two, the two main things. And the reason why people may find some veins attractive, because you're right. I think women like some, but not a lot, right? You don't want the crazy looking ones. Is because it's uh, it's just a sign that someone's lean. That's all. It just looks like you're. It shows off that you're at a, a decent. Yeah, I can't. Size. I can't speak to why uh, certain women like it or not. I know I've I've had plenty of comments from like nurses for that reason. Like uh, just because I think it's easy to find. Right, the point that Justin made. Yeah. Um, Did you, do you get really veiny when you're yeah, shredded? Yeah, yeah. Where? I mean, I'm already. I'm I'm naturally vascular. Already. Oh, a little you bit, know, huh? Yeah. Right there. No, yeah. like crazy. My when I get really lean, they'll they'll pop out everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they definitely. That's. That's a weird thing. Like I used to, when I would play sports or uh, I get like really angry, I'd get this like two veins in my forehead. It was always would stick out. Like this doesn't really happen as much anymore. Mm. But interesting. Yeah, is this the kid right here who's asking the question? Yes. Yeah. He's pretty lean already. Uh, and you see his, he's got some vascularity. He's got the, the bicep vein and, the, and some forearm vein stuff, but uh, he's already lean enough that he would, he would be, if he was a vascular person, it would be popping out already. Yeah. Just, now, one just thing that I notice, just draw him on when yeah. I got really lean. If I get below, let's say eight percent or seven percent, um, is that I notice my veins will come out after I eat, especially if I eat carbs, like almost within fifteen minutes. I'll eat mm -hmm. carbs and then within fifteen minutes, oh see yeah, my veins start to come out. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. If you know, if you're super depleted and lean like that, and then you, car I used to love that. I mean, you could, you would see it like happen within 30 minutes to an hour mm -hmm. all of a sudden they start popping out but yeah i mean you're yeah, there again there's just like a a, a level of like that of, that you can actually control is the big thing is going to be if you already genetically are that way and then getting really lean all the the carb yeah. the carb and water manipulation to try and 
look more vascular that's all temporary yeah. yeah so you do all that before you go out and then you do a little bfr <laughs> yeah. and then you yeah. got so your, that's, your veins all throbbing dude yeah, that's go taking it to it. another that's yeah. taking it to but another I mean, level you know the, the, all the pump supplements and stuff like that i mean they might help a little bit but i don't think it's going to make a, a you know a huge difference all that stuff is temporary though yeah. i mean imagine if you if you want to be more vascular you want to be more vascular all the time you're not looking for a, a 30 minute fix right? That's right i would think yeah so. i used to work with a, a va i used to train some vascular surgeons one of the more popular procedures that they would do that was uh not a like a prescribed procedure right because they would have to work a lot on people who were going to die and stuff like that but they did some cosmetic procedures one of them was varicose vein uh type of uh, surgery where they'd actually go in and they would like almost like kill the vein so that the person doesn't have varicose veins anymore mm. it's pretty crazy next question is from Dratella. how do you successfully exit out of overtraining Will you gain fat if you go about it too abruptly? Should you treat it like a reverse diet, slowly, slowly easing out of it? No, no, question. no. The best way to get out of uh, overtraining is to immediately cease your workouts. It is not a slow reverse out. If you slowly reverse out of overtraining, you're just going to be overtrained for much longer. Yeah. The best thing you could do if you really are in a state of overtrain is to stop. Stop workouts, stop everything. You can do some stretching, some walking, recuperative type stuff, and then let your body <clears throat> recover. Now, as far as gaining body fat, no. In fact, and I know this doesn't sound like it makes sense. because like, oh, you're burning less calories. No, the truth is if you're really overtrained and then you rest- you build uh, muscle. Yeah, you actually yeah. you actually come to, back a little leaner. I actually muscle. I actually think that this is one of the ways that I try and, and teach somebody to figure out if they are. Is like, okay, if you're stuck at this hard plateau. We think that you might be overtraining like crazy. Let's take like a week off, like fully recover so that when you come back, I want your volume of training to be cut in half. Don't change anything else. Let's see what happens. And if you build more muscle and or get leaner, right, you look better, feel better, get stronger uh, over the next two or three weeks of cutting the volume in half, then that's a clear sign that yep. you are overtraining. If you put on a bunch of body fat and you don't gain any more muscle, you don't get stronger, then maybe you weren't overtraining. Maybe there was something else going on. So this is actually one of the ways I think that you can tell if you're overtraining is by simply reducing the volume, you get in better shape. You get stronger because of it. Every time when I'm overtrained, yeah. I have less muscle and more body fat. When I get out of it, it's exactly what happens. I build muscle and and I end up getting leaner. In fact, when I would get people who are like really, like I could really see like, oh, this is person's overtrained they would always be shocked yeah that doing less would because they all expect to do less to <clears> feel <throat> better people are like okay i think i need a rest i need you know i'll feel better but they're always shocked that they get better results all well, of a sudden yeah a lot of times my clients it, it'll reveal it more effectively to them when they go on like a week-long vacation they don't actually train and then they feel so energetic and strong yeah. and like everything's working so amazingly like the following week and it's just, that's such a clear indication you know that you're just doing too much listen if, if your uh, body has to choose to either survive or build muscle it's going to try to survive first right. that's its yep. number one priority so and if you've been beating it up so bad it's constantly thinking about surviving it's not thinking about building muscle simply reducing that volume and intensity and scaling it back or and or feeding the body appropriately now gets the body to go like oh we're good we're not we're not struggling to live and survive now i can prioritize building the, muscle the hormone profile that's associated with overtraining is a hormone profile that is anti-muscle and pro-fat storage, especially visceral body fat or trunk body fat. Body For the fat survival reasons. Right, so the hormone profile that's associated with appropriate training is pro-muscle and, and pro-fat loss. So what do those two look like? Well, uh, a pro or an anti-muscle pro-fat storage is high cortisol, all day, okay, because you should get a spike in cortisol in the morning, but then it should go down and be low at night. Well, somebody who's under chronic stress or overtraining has got cortisol that's just high all the time. It's insulin insensitivity. So you actually start to lose sensitivity to insulin. It's a reduction in androgen receptor density. These are the receptors that testosterone attaches to. It's lower testosterone. It's a lower growth hormone. So you're, what's happening is your body is literally resisting building more muscle because if you're overtrained and there's too much stress, the last thing your body wants to do is 
increase its uh, energy demands by building muscle. Because in throughout all of human history, except from relatively recently, you wanted to be efficient with calories. And if you were under a lot of stress, you wanted to even become even more efficient with calories. More muscle is not the way to do that. More muscle make, means you burn more calories. So your body is literally organizing itself in a way to make all your goals much harder to accomplish when you're overtrained. So you're going to store more body fat, especially around the midsection. You're going to not build as much muscle. Now, when you come out of that and you do it right and you rest, and the best way to do this is immediate and abrupt. It is not a slow reduction. It is immediate and abrupt. Uh, that's the fastest way to get there. Um, then what will happen is the hormones start to change again over time and your body starts to allow itself to have more energy demands by building more muscle. And it allows itself to burn more body fat uh, as a result because it doesn't feel so stressed out like it needs to hold on to everything. So, and I know people, it's, you know, this whole calories in versus calories out, that calories outside of the equation it can change dramatically depending on your lifestyle, but on your hormones and on what your body thinks is, is going to be beneficial for itself. And being overtrained is not a great place to really have a lean, muscular, healthy physique. Next question is from Justin Lifts Weight. Oh, he does, doesn't No, he doesn't. <laughs> I, am, I am very hamstring and glute dominant. How do I make lower body movements more quad-based, especially unilateral? Oh, you're blessed. <laughs> yeah. Here's here's a here's a easy so rare. Here, yeah, and, and here's an easy way to do that. Uh, all Justins are glute dominant. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the good. thing, apparently. Yeah. yeah. It, the, here's a easy way to do it. When you do your lower body exercises like squats, lunges. Um, uh, wear squat shoes. Yeah, elevate the heels. Yeah, mm -hmm. elevate the heels a little bit. That'll increase the amount of knee uh, flexion and extension, which is going to activate the quads a little more. So I typically don't recommend that to people, but that's one way to do it. Literally, while you're doing your barbell squats, elevate your heels and your form will change to put more of the demand on the quads. Step ups, lunges, yeah, leaning your chest squats, forward, uh, you know, feet squats. lower on a leg press. There's a lot of different ways to, to by changing the the angle for you to put more emphasis on the quads yeah. instead of the glutes. Now the easiest also, if you ever want to, anybody who's listening, if you want to emphasize a body part, the easiest way to do it is to work that specific body part at the beginning of the workout. Yeah. So at the beginning of your leg workouts, this is a great time to do quad isolation exercises first, which you normally don't see, but this this would be a great time to do it. So leg extensions, sissy squats. Yeah, sissy squats would be a great one to start yeah, with. Yeah, do like two quad exercises first, then go to all your other leg exercises and you're going to get more quad development uh, by doing it that way. And you'll get less of the glute and hamstring development. Now for the reverse, obviously if somebody wants more glute or hamstring, it would be the same advice, right? Uh, is to prioritize that at the beginning of the workout. Mm-hmm. Next question is from Reese Hokianga. How to push yourself without a gym partner or hurting yourself? I think the gym partner thing is so overrated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I uh, think that's sort of the the messaging that I would probably put out there is like, like what's what's the real value in your gym partner? Like what that you can't find yourself in terms of like if you look at the right dose of intensity, the right dose for you individually, um, it, it it's it, it gets muddy in terms of having like somebody there that's motivating you to kind of push past you know those natural signals your body's giving you in terms of like finding that sweet spot where you're going to actually adapt and build muscle versus just hammer yourself a bit too hard. This is that's a problem with our space is we we value motivation so much. I hate yeah. that. I hate that argument. Like oh, it's so much more motivating with my friend or oh, my friend motivates me. It's just like. Stop it. If you want this to be a lifelong pursuit for you, you've got to get rid of this idea that you need to be motivated to do the Imagine things. Imagine if everything was like that. I know. I only yeah. do things I, I'm motivated to do. It'll like, never last. You know how much it'll stuff never I last. wouldn't do? Where's that's my where, reading partner? Yeah, is, it's like, I'm not going <laughs> to read without my reading partner. That's why I can't stand it because it's just a, it's a, it's a terrible message yeah. and, and our space promotes it so much and we, we lean into it in so many- Because it feels good. Fitness influencers want to be motivating. Yeah, yeah it's, it gives you this initial feel good feeling. But for our listeners, like it's such a it's a it's a bad strategy. Like learn to be disciplined. Learn to create habits. Yeah, and and you're far better off doing that for yourself. Somebody is always suffering. If there's a a, a partner workout. Whoever is leading it is getting the most benefits because they're doing what they probably want to do or need to do for their body. And then the other person is suffering because it's not what is ideal 
for them. And even if that's what motivates you to go to the gym, eventually they're not going to be around. Eventually you're going to move. Eventually they're going to get married and have kids. Eventually shit's going to happen. And so you need to start to learn how to create habits that you don't need anybody else. That doesn't mean that you can't have fun yeah. and or work out with somebody a partner. there. Yeah. And, I'm not saying I'm not shaming somebody yeah. who has a workout partner. I'm just saying that we put too much emphasis on motivation and this need for other people to be a let, part of our work. Let me put it like this with workout partners. I have nothing. I have no issue with workout partners except for the following. Okay. Imagine you're about to embark on your fitness journey and you know that this is going to be something that if I want it to be effective and real, I have to do for the rest of my life. Okay. So I'm not going to do this for a month and then stop. The goal is to do this for the rest of my life. Now you got to go find a workout partner that's going to work out with you on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at four, whatever your time is forever. Okay. Good luck. First of all, there's almost nobody you'd want to see three days a week for an hour oh, yeah. <laughs> forever and, 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 re and depend on that type of consistency to show up, to work out, to want to be around this person. Like that's a tough, and, and nobody talks about this. This is actually kind of funny. Uh, breaking up with workout partners. I've had people cancel gym memberships because <laughs> they are, don't awkward. want to break up with their workout partner. So they'd rather go to another gym Yeah, because then they, because otherwise they'd break up with a workout partner and then they're worried about running into them at the gym when they work out on their own or whatever. I've had, I've only had a few workout partners that I, let's say I'd work out like relatively consistently with. And the, the breakup part sucks because then you got to tell them, like, hey, listen, <laughs> you show up late every time or I mean, it's not really working type yeah. of deal. And it's a friend or someone, you know, type of deal. Um, yeah, no. Uh, now, here's here's the other part of this. Peop th the majority of people who are not getting good results is because they're not showing up, not because they're not working out hard enough. Now, yes, there are people who need to work out harder. Yeah. But that's not the big problem. That's it, it's a problem, but it's a small one mm -hmm. in comparison to just showing up. So about this, like I need someone to push me. If you showed up and you just show up, then you're probably going to be okay. Well, now that we're done ragging on you for, for wanting a workout partner to answer this question, though, if you were trying to push yourself more. So in other words, increase the intensity of my workout without risking injury or hurting myself because I don't have someone, let's say, to spot myself. One of my favorite things to do is to choose a weight that's difficult for me. So let's say I'm doing a five by five, so I'm doing five reps. I choose a weight that is difficult, but I know I'm going to probably be able to get five because I don't have a spotter, so I don't want something I'm going to fail at doing. And then as I get to the last rep or two, I slow the tempo down dramatically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, If you take somebody who does this kind of cadence where this is what, what what a bench press tempo looks like for them. And they're like, oh, wow, this rep number three is easy. Oh, wow, rep number four is easy. Now watch this. And you slow that last rep down yeah. completely. I mean, you could take that that muscle to damn near complete exhaustion by so and then and you're moving a weight that you can comfortably, if you realize, oh, I'm not gonna be able to get it up, you speed up the, the tempo and you rack the weight. Like uh, this idea that you need to have uh, these sets that take you to failure so much that you need a spotter. And by the way, most people that even do that do this wrong. Yeah, like it was used to be one of my pet peeves when somebody would would spot me and they do this. Come on, bro! Come on, bro! And you that got was it. The angle I was going to go because immediately, like rereading this question, it's like, uh, you know, if you're testing yourself and you're going heavier than you normally do, you really have to know how to bail, and you have to know how to like dump weight and you have to know all these ways of getting out of those situations set and set up safeties yeah. and all that kind of stuff. There's a way to do that very effectively. And there's a lot more uh, machines, racks and things that have those available. So, you know, look, uh, look, ask somebody or how to like set that up. But, but even just doing a basic like squat, like you, you should, you should know that technique of being able to dump the weight and bail and not feel bad about like slam the weights. Yeah, listen, yeah. people don't hurt themselves working out because they didn't have a gym partner. They hurt themselves because they picked an inappropriate weight for what they were trying to do, or they had bad technique or bad form. That's all. It's not because you didn't have a, a, a workout partner. It's because you're doing it wrong. That's it. That's the bottom line. I think I've seen more 
bad technique and form with a workout partner than I have alone. I'll yeah. make a bet right now. I agree. I don't know if there's any statistics on it, but I bet you people get hurt more often yes. with workout partners than when yes. they work out on their own. Because you get somebody who they, they uh, think, Oh, he'll help me lift they this think off. It's a They're great not strategy attention. to push so hard to where you fail and get stuck. And when you do that, the body goes into this like, oh shit, get it off me. And then you try and help the weight up with every other muscle than the one you're really trying to work. Technique goes out the window. Yeah. And, yeah. and then it defeats the purpose of why you're doing the movement. And, yeah. you know, so yeah, I'm, I've never been a big fan of the the workout partner thing. <laughs> and most of the workouts that I ever worked out with someone else, I led the workout because selfishly, I want to do what I want to do. I'm yeah. like, I know what I need to do. I know how, I, how much I need to push today. I know how much, how many sets I need to do of what. Like, so, okay, if you want to jump in my workout and follow along what I'm doing, that's fine. But, you know, curtailing my workout to what somebody else potentially needs is just not ideal. And you don't need that person to take you to, you can have an intense workout and not take take the, every exercise to failure. I, 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 I hurt myself with workout partners uh, way more often. Yes. Than I do on my own. Because, Trying to show off. Well, you got to wait that you, oh, they'll help me lift it. And like, like first off, a spotter on squatting. It's terrible idea. Worst. You're going to get, you're That's going. That's where I literally hurt my knee. Yeah. It's, yeah. Terrible idea. Okay. They, they end up moving you forward and, yeah. and the whole weight crushed me forward. Yeah. Uh, uh, spotting on a, like a bench press. Everybody thinks that's a great idea. If you're picking a weight that you can, you, you're afraid that you're not going to be able to get up with the spotter, um, your form's going to go out the window while he's spotting you or she's spotting you. So also um, not a good idea. Spotters with dumbbells. That's an interesting one. You know, um, I, you guys ever do this where you're, you're, <laughs> I was a kid. We'd do like the dumbbell chest press. Of course, when I was a kid, you know, it was all about how much weight you could lift type of deal. Yeah. Where they spot you under the elbows. You end yeah, up they push hitting your, your elbows. Hitting, your, <laughs> hitting yourself in the face with the dumbbell. Uh, and it comes in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That ever happened to you? That's a good time. Yeah. Then you learn the technique yeah. of how to do it yourself. Yeah. So much better. No, no, no. You got to train with the right intensity. Don't go to failure. Stop a couple reps short. Have good technique. And if you're going to max out, use safeties on a power rack. And that's about it. Then you'll be set. Look, if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com. And check out all of our free fitness guides. They're all free and they're awesome. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. I am also there at Mind Pump to Stefano and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 